I live and work on Kwandamuka country. I want to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the land of the Turrbal and Jagara people, and I want to acknowledge their elders, past, present, and to come, especially the women. I also want to acknowledge the women's resistance, of which we are the latest iteration, and I'd like to acknowledge the women of the first and second waves in particular. We're living in unprecedented times in the intensity and breadth of attacks against the rights of women, girls, and especially lesbians. The attacks are orchestrated because of the ideological commitment by the state, the corporations, and the universities to erase the very existence of women as a sex class. So we're seeing the unravelling of basic rights we've taken for granted for decades. And we can't ignore the connections of that unravelling with the other attacks against women in the prostitution industry, surrogacy, the normalisation of pedophilia, etc. Over the next few days, we'll hear from women who are well informed on how these attacks are unfoldingly, unfolding and importantly, what we can do about it. Indeed, how they've been unfolding for a long time. Only most of us were unaware. Many in the lesbian community were aware and were fighting it. It was as long ago as 1979 that Janice Raymond wrote her book, The Transsexual Empire, The Making of the She-Male. It was as long ago as the 1990s that Australian lesbians had to defend in the courts their right to gather as lesbians without men. And they lost. Jess Hoyle from Tasmania took up the issue more recently, but had to withdraw for lack of funds. Some of the women at this conference have been teaching feminism and how to confront male supremacy for a while. We have much to learn over the next few days and beyond from the women who've been in this struggle for a long time. And we need to do that from a place of deep love and profound willingness to learn. I said recently to a woman new to the struggle that we need to learn from our sisters who've had years of experience and she responded, oh yes, the suffragettes were great, which of course they were, but I wasn't referring to the suffragettes. I was actually referring to the woman she had stood next to at a recent event who was one of the first Australian lesbians, if not the first, to have successfully won custody of her daughter post-divorce in the face of the claim that because she was a lesbian, she was an unfit mother. That was the woman and others like her that I was referring to, women who are still here fighting. And sadly, I see some women who are new to the struggle who are disdainful, even hostile, to the work that many women who are currently involved have done over the decades. I see some women who are new to the struggle attempt to appropriate the work of others. To say, for example, they have long been involved in feminist grassroots activism when they have not. How much more generous and accurate to acknowledge the work of other women instead of saying it was yours. I see some women who are new to the struggle openly and publicly disparage feminists for their work. Work differently by all means, but dispense with the public attacks, please. They help no one. Over these three days, we'll be able to discuss not only the unfolding of the attacks against women, but the ways we have to join together and fight back, limited as our means are. And we need to consider where we're falling down in the management of our different politics. Because sometimes we do it poorly or even with malevolence. Many of us have read about it and seen it. We've seen the bullies and the show ponies whose commitment to the class of women is shallow because they're concerned more with their individual promotion. We have an opportunity to challenge in ourselves some of the behavior we criticize in the trans activists. I want to quote from a Facebook friend's recent post. Her name's Di, and she writes, 
But it's not that alone that's breaking my heart right now. It's the toxicity that lurks within my feminist sisterhood that hurts the most. This is not the time to tread on other women to make a name for yourself. This is not the time to spread rumour, gossip or lie about the sisters in this struggle with you. This is not the time to dictate to other women how they should participate in this fight, nor question with whom they choose to stand beside whilst they fight this good fight. Now is the time to dial back your arrogance. Turn up your righteous rage. Stand shoulder to shoulder with your sisters against our common enemies. I won't rest on this. This is still die speaking. I will stand up for myself and all my sisters, even the ones that have caused me harm, attacked me, or don't want me to fight for them at all. End of Dai's quote. Part of Dai's message is, we all do this differently. Let's just accept that and not bully other women to impose our ways of doing things onto them. If you don't like the way they work, initiate your own work. Don't put energy into bad-mouthing other women in the struggle. I've never been an academic, nor have I ever written a book, but I value those women who have. And the attacks I've seen against women who are academics or have written books, or even those of us who've read books, <laughs> are not acceptable. Yes? And the attacks against women of the left are also not acceptable. Yes, the current left has abandoned any semblance of support for women's rights, it's true. But many of those fighting back are left-wing women and a whole bunch of you are in this room. And we fight from a left-wing perspective, not all of us, but some of us. We need to make the connections in our different areas of struggle, whether they be for acceptance of the reality that women are a sex class, or whether they be to oppose the porn industry, or the sex trafficking, or surrogacy industry, or the industry that seeks to legitimize pedophilia. They're all connected. I'll quote from Joe Bartosz, a UK feminist journalist who writes, there is a long and deep connection between those pushing for the full decriminalization of the sex industry and transgenderism. Perhaps at heart, this is because both prostitution and transgenderism depend upon the sexualized objectification of women. It also takes a similar athletic leap of logic to argue that men are the most oppressed kind of women <laughs> and that legalizing prostitution makes women safer. Joe Bartosz wrote that in January in The Critic. Both Rose Hunter and Ali Diamond will present at this conference, speaking against the prostitution industry. And this is opportune because the Queensland government intends to legislate not only for men who claim they're women, but also for the full decriminalisation of prostitution instead of introducing the Nordic model. And we also know that porn drives the misogyny of gender activism. We'll also hear from a young radical feminist about the crucial importance of the women's liberation movement for young women in particular. In this context, a recent study by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in the US is of significance. Nearly one in three high school girls reported in 2021 that they seriously considered suicide up nearly 60% from the previous decade. Almost 15% of teen girls said they were forced to have sex, an increase of 27% over two years. These things are not unconnected with the rise of transgenderism. In 2020, IWDBM and four other feminist groups nationally urged the Queensland government to consider the decline in the mental health of girls who try to become boys or think they can instead of legislating to enable that further by removing healthy breasts. The Queensland government ignored us and embarked on its transing the gay away ideology with legislation and they are now heading also for sex self-ID legislation. 
In addition to the speakers I've named, we'll hear from other women who give their hearts and their minds to winning back and advancing further women's rights. I won't mention all those women. Each one has my deep respect. I do want to mention that we have not only local speakers, but speakers also from Perth, Canberra, Sydney, Melbourne, though by video, far north Queensland, Hobart, even from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and from the UK. Welcome to you all, and especially to Tanya Sturt from Aotearoa and Sheila Jeffries from the UK. I want to thank in particular Renata Klein and Susan Hawthorne for connecting me to three of our speakers, Sheila Jeffries, Betty McClellan, and Rose Hunter. I also want to thank Helen and Isla and Narissa for offering me their personal support at a difficult recent time. The capacity to offer personal and political support is often underrated. Solidarity is a word we hear little of today. And when we do mention it, it's often without much discussion. We need to discuss solidarity and how to develop it. I'd also like to thank a woman called Camilla, whose second name I won't mention, who first introduced me to transgenderism in 2016, a woman much younger than me. I want to thank the other five women who will be sharing chairing responsibilities with me, Donna Malone, Sal Grover, who's also a speaker at the conference, Narissa Scott, another speaker, Christine Carrick, and Steph Hughes, also a speaker. I want to thank the donors of the two raffle prizes, to Spinifex, who donated the book On the Meaning of Sex by Cassia Eckes Ekman, a recent title by a Marxist feminist who, being a genuine Marxist, recognizes women as a sex class. The book will be launched on International Women's Day by Bronwyn Winter at a spin effect Zoom event, if you're interested. And the other raffle prize is this beautiful shawl hanging over my chair, crocheted by Janet Fraser, also a conference speaker. The winning raffle tickets, and the tickets are a mere $5 each, or five for $20, will be drawn by our international guests on Sunday, Tanya and Sheila. I'd like to thank the women who gave the prizes for this year's Eva Bacon and Magdalene Burns Awards, the winners of which will be announced at tomorrow's rally. Lesbian feminist artist Donna Malone, has donated a stunning piece of art, and Betty, the mother of one of our supporters, made us a quilt in feminist colors. I'd like to thank Claire, Emma, and Judy, the three-woman panel from regional Queensland who assessed the nominations for the two awards and decided on the winners. I'd like to thank the other helpers, Jessie on registration and raffle sales, and Kylie on merch sales. We know now that the Legal Affairs Committee in Queensland has recommended that the Parliament pass sex self-ID. It was never going to be any different. The ALP MPs were never going to listen to women's concerns, although we voiced them loudly with evidence and passion. They had been given their instructions and women's and girls' rights were not an issue. I'd like to thank all of you. Many of you have already visited your MPs, written letters, put in government submissions, come to the Brisbane rallies that I've organised, even written, printed and letterboxed your own flyers, all with a view to convincing the Queensland Government to not proceed with this wholesale erasure of women's rights. I know you'll be inspired by our speakers and each other to keep up the fight because this isn't over. Queensland women, like the women of Scotland, won't wished. 
I want to mention the Women's Declaration International. It's a group of volunteer women from across the globe dedicated to defending women's sex-based rights. One of its directors, Sheila Jeffries, is with us at this conference. The Declaration on Women's Sex-Based Rights was created by the founders of WDI to lobby individual nations and the UN to support our rights. It's based on our sex-based rights. It was passed by the UN in 1979. It was signed and ratified by Australia. CEDAW requires signature countries to enact policies that reject sex-based stereotypes. From my non-legal eye, countries like Australia are in direct breach of CEDAW because they've embraced gender ideology which relies on sex-based stereotypes. Currently, the WDI Declaration has more than 34,000 signatories from 160 countries. It was launched in 2019 in the US and the UK. IWDBM was one of the early Australian groups to support it, and we host one of the two Australian launches of the Declaration in 2020 at our annual conference. Anna Kerr is our country contact for WDI, and Anna won last year's Eva Bacon Award. I'd like to acknowledge the work of two interstate public women who are fighting to defend our sex-based rights. Moira Deeming is a newly elected MP in the Victorian Parliament who used her maiden speech to support women's and girls' rights. Councillor Louise Elliott, is a member of the Hobart City Council. She attempted unsuccessfully to restore women's and girls' facilities at the Hobart Aquatic Centre. It's to the eternal shame of the Hobart City Council, not only that it rejected Louise's efforts, but also because it tolerated disgraceful behaviour by another councillor Councillor Ryan Posselt, who was incensed that a woman would disagree with him. <laughs> thank you, Louise. Thank you, Moira. And thank you also to Sal Grover, who's continuing the defence of our rights in the courts against a bloke who wants to be on Giggle, an app for women. It's my great pleasure and privilege to organise this annual RADFEM conference. I continue to do it for as long as I can and the conference has value for feminists. As you know, only the presentations will be videoed. The Q&A panels will not. So feel free about asking your questions and making your comments. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Betty McClellan lives on Wulguru Kaba Bindal country, the area we know as Townsville. Betty is a feminist ethicist who never tires of speaking truth to power. A psychotherapist by profession, she successfully combines her work as a psychotherapist with a broader emphasis on feminist ethical analysis and activism. She's the author of several books, including Unspeakable, A Feminist Ethic of Speech, and Help, I'm Living with a Man Boy. Betty will address the topic, Truth, a Radical Response to Identity Politics. Please make her welcome. Welcome. 